So I am going to talk about a project that I have been working on for uh, probably about six months now. And what I really wanted to do was to sort of come up with something weird and wonderful to use Java for. And I looked around, and clearly one of the things which is very popular at the moment and very topical is the idea of machine learning and deep learning. So I thought, OK, how can I take that and then build something with it? So this is what I've come up with. Building a brain with Raspberry Pi and Zulu embedded JVM. Right, what are we going to talk about then? Well, let's start with a bit of background. So I thought to myself, when I was putting these slides together today, I thought, I am the thing that is standing between you and Jack Daniels. Although I can actually see a couple of people have already got some Jack Daniels, yes. So, but the rest of you, you have to listen to me before you get to the Jack Daniels. So I thought, I'll put a juke up there with Jack Daniels. We'll start off with a bit of background, a bit of an introduction to the whole idea of machine learning and how this project came about. So the first thing was a book which I read probably about 10 years ago now. And this is a book called On Intelligence. It's by Jeff Hawkins. And Jeff Hawkins was somebody who did a lot of work, um, oh, goodness me, it must have been about 20 years ago now, on a thing called the Palm Pilot. Anybody remember the Palm Pilot? No? Oh, yeah, one person in the back there. OK. Anybody have? It had a Palm Pilot. One person at the back there. OK, good. Well, the Palm Pilot was kind of like a, a, a personal digital assistant. And one of the things it had on there was a handwriting recognition system. The handwriting recognition system wasn't a recognition system that worked in the sense of you just used the, you wrote things normally. It had a thing called graffiti. So it was a kind of stylized way of entering text. Now, you had to learn a new way of writing, but it was actually something you could do very quickly, and it was very effective. But it was something which relied on a certain level of um, fuzzy logic and pattern matching, because it couldn't directly you know, just use the shapes. It had to actually re uh, recognize variations on those shapes. So it was, in a sense, the start of the sort of machine learning and artificial um, intelligence kind of thing. So Jeff then went on to write this book called On Intelligence, which was his sort of theory, having studied a lot of uh, details about how the brain works, in terms of how you could take that and turn it into machine learning, and make a machine work in the same way as a human brain. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, human uh, neurology. I'm not going to talk very long about this, just, just like one slide, just to kind of give you some ideas. So this is a picture of our brain. And it's an interesting sort of concept in terms of how it works. There is this thing called the neocortex. And I, I won't spend too long on this, but the neocortex is like the, the outer layer of your brain. And that's really what you are in terms of your personality, in terms of your intelligence. There's lots of other parts of the brain that control various things, the process imaging and, and things like that. But the neocortex is really where the intelligence, if you like, resides. And you can model that with business cards. How do business cards relate to your brain is that there are actually six layers of cells in the neocortex. And they are actually about the thickness of a business card. So if you put six business cards together, you're looking at a physical representation of your neocortex. Now, that's all wrapped around the outside of your, your other parts of your brain. And obviously, it kind of makes it bigger by having all these folds in it. But this is the idea. We're, we're trying to model the neocortex. And so what Jeff came up with was this idea of what he called the hierarchical temporal memory. And it was a, a theoretical idea of a framework about how the neocortex worked. So you have these six layers in the neocortex. The six layers consist of these things called neurons. And neurons are connected by synapses, and that's how they interact. So there's, it's a network of cells called neurons with synapses between them, which can form an immense number of connections. 
Right. There's all sorts of other things as well. There's things called dendrites and stuff like that, but I won't go into to the details of that. Suffice to say that this is the sort of basic ideas of a neural network. And these ideas have been around for a while. There's been different ways of modeling them and so on. But what was different in terms of what Jeff did was that he also included time in that. So rather than just saying, OK, you can have a, a, a class, if you like, that represents a neuron, you can set certain values and you just use that neuron. He also included the idea of time so that as you used the, the neuron and you had different inputs, if those inputs weren't used, the effect of that input would fade, fade over time. So it included this temporal idea as well. Potentially, much better model in terms of learning. Right. Introduction to machine learning. Uh, this slide has been around for, or this image has been around for a long time. And you may not be able to read what it says at the bottom. But it says, good work, but I think we might need a little more detail right here. And in the box there it says, then a miracle happens. And that's kind of what machine learning is like. You, you've got input data, then a miracle happens somewhere in this machine learning piece of software, and out comes an answer. But it's this, how do you actually get this answer from the, the inside? That's the tricky bit. Right, let's talk a little bit about learning and computers. So machine learning, what we're doing here is, and there's a definition here, which is you're giving computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. It's the idea that the, the algorithm, if you like, can evolve over time. You give it data, it can then learn from that and adapt to changes in the data so that the results you get out of the, the end of the process can change over time. The computer learns based on new input to do different things. Now, in its, I say, simplest form, machine learning, because there's machine learning, there's deep learning, and then there's deep reinforcement learning. So machine learning is the, the sort of simplest one. This is where you take a set of data and you train your model. So you say, here's a set of results that I have got previously, and you can use those to learn to predict, based on some new inputs, what the results might be. And you can do that in different ways, because what you can do is you can say, OK, I've got a set of data which I can use to train, but I won't use all of that. I'll take two-thirds of it to use as my training data, and then I'll take the other third to verify what I've done in terms of the training. So you take your training data, you, you build the model, then you take the, the rest of your data and you push it through the model and see what the, the results are like. So does it correctly predict the rest of your training data? And then you can actually move that around. So you take different sets of training data, different sets of testing data, and gradually build your model that way. But the important thing is that you need labeled training data. So it needs to know what the values are and how they relate to the problem. Now, in its simplest form, what we're dealing with here is predictions based on like a graph. This is really a, a very simple example where you have two dimensions. I've used this example because it's easy to see and it's easy to understand. Typically, the kind of things that we're doing with machine learning are going to have lots of dimensions. There'll be lots of different inputs that you need to process. So they all form different dimensions. But as humans, we can't kind of conceive that because we think in three dimensions, maybe four if you include time. But if we look at a simple example here where we've got two dimensions, what we're dealing with is a series of points on our graph which represent our training data. And then what we're trying to do is to come up with a mathematical function, which in this case is a simple line, which fits that data. Then if we want to make a prediction, we can say, OK, my x value is this. Look at what the line is and say that would be the predicted y value. OK, very simple in that sense. So what we're doing here is we're using the simplest possible prediction in terms of saying, OK, let's fit a straight line through that data. And you know, as a human, if you look at it, 
we can see that most of the data fits fairly well. There's, there's one point which is right at the very top, which is kind of a bit outside of the line. But on the whole, the, the error function is quite small. Of course, we can be more sophisticated. So we could use, rather than just a straight linear function, we could take a polynomial function, and we could apply a number of different factors to that polynomial, and we could end up with a curved graph. But the problem is that we can, we can do what's called overfitting. Overfitting is where you take your data and you say, OK, let's draw a line that goes through every single point that we have in our data set. And that way, we could pr correctly predict every single piece of data that we had as training data. But if we look at that, we'll see that the, the polynomial that we end up producing is very odd. And certainly, if you compare it to the straight line, I'm fairly sure that if I put a point very near the, the bottom of the x-axis, and I looked at what the predicted value is, the straight line would actually give me a better result than my polynomial that fits all of the points that I have. So this is this idea of overfitting our data. So the tricky bit is trying to figure out, do we go with the simplest possible model, the most complex model, or something in between? And that's why you, you tend to take different sets of training data, then use the remaining data to test against that and gradually get something which works in the best possible way. Now, deep learning is taking that a little bit further. So what we're doing with deep learning is talking about neural networks. So we have a neural network which has neurons in it. And a neuron, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide, takes a set of inputs, has a weight which it applies to those inputs, then takes all of them and applies them to a function in that neuron and produces a result. And then we can connect these together in order to determine um, processing of our input data. Now, these neurons, modeling it on our brain, are organized in layers. So you have a number of layers, pass information in at the top, have it processed by one layer, pass that information to the next layer, down through the layers and so on. The idea of that is that you can have different layers of abstraction for the problem. So you, if, you think about, if you think about image processing, you start at the top with a set of pixels. And that represents the, the image that, say, a camera has seen. What you then want to do is, is to reduce that into an abstraction of those pixels, which could be edge detection. So you, you detect all the edges, and that gives you a, a smaller set of data, but gives you a, a, an abstraction of what you started with. You can then that, pass that into another layer, which looks at the arrangement of those edges, and then tries to determine what the object is. And then you pass it into another layer. And what you get at the bottom is an answer which says, the picture is a cat, or the picture is a dog. So it's building an abstraction and getting lower levels to the point where you actually have an answer about what's in the picture. As I said, this is a good analogy to the, the hierarchical temporal model that um, Jeff Hawkins came up with. This uses unsupervised learning. So machine learning uses supervised learning where you have labeled data. Unsupervised learning is where you still have training data, but the data isn't labeled. So you have to classify the data as part of the algorithm. There's, there's more work that needs to be done in terms of deep learning. So if we look at the, the idea of a, a neuron, this is what we're really de dealing with, a, a node in our neural network. So as I said, we have a number of inputs, and you know, we can vary this based on how we want to configure our neural network. We take inputs, which either can be from our raw data, or they can be from other nodes in a, a higher layer of our neural network. And we pass those values through a weighting function. So we, we say, OK, this connection is more important than any other. So we multiply the input value by a bigger number to say, OK, this is a more important input. Less important inputs will have a smaller weighting factor, so the, the input value is less important. We take all of those weighted input values, and then we apply some function. 
it could be just adding them up. It could be adding them up and dividing them by the number to get an average. It could be doing something more sophisticated. But we apply a function to that, and then we get a result. And we pass that result onto another layer of our neural network, or it becomes the actual result of the neural network itself. If we look at the way we can arrange these neurons, what we have is a network. Organize it in layers. So at the bottom, in this case, we've got our input layer. So we, we pass the, you know, if we're dealing with a picture, we pass the pixels into the nodes of our input layer. We do edge detection or whatever we, we are doing in terms of that layer of the, the neural network. And then we pass those results onto what's called a hidden layer. Hidden layers are just layers between the input and the output. And you can have multiple uh, of those. And then we'll have a number of hidden layers passing to the output layer. Output layer will classify the result and then determine what to return to whatever system we're using to, to use that result. Now, in terms of the way that we can connect these things, the important thing is that you, um, in this type of neural network, you only have network uh, connections that go one way. So they go from the input to the hidden layers to the output. There's no um, connections back again. You can have new neural networks that do that. So you can have feedback loops in your network. But typically, you don't bother doing that. And you don't also have connections between the nodes in the layer. So it's only between different layers. And typically, you don't bother having the connections that go backwards. The last type of machine learning that we need to talk about is what's called deep reinforcement learning. And this is much more like we as humans learn. If you think about it, when you're born, nobody provides you with a training data set. They don't give you a set of things to, to push into you and then say, right, this is what we're going to use to train you, and then you can do everything that a human can do. No, the way that we learn as humans is trial and error. So we start off and we say, OK, you know, we want to learn to drive a car, so we need to like, figure out how things work, maybe make a mistake, don't do it again, figure out what works, what doesn't work. So this is reinforcement learning. And this is kind of like the third level of machine learning. Without going into too much detail, um, there are a couple of other things which are worth spending a couple of moments talking about. One of these is what's called a Markov decision process. And this is the idea where what we want to be able to do is have some input and then make a decision about what to do next. And this, this is quite important because of the, the demo that I'm actually going to show you and the, the project I've been working on. So the idea is it's a mathematical model which allows you to make decisions. And as I said, reinforcement learning is the idea that you make a decision, you see whether it works or not, and then if it works, that becomes a reinforcement. If it doesn't work, you discard that as a, a possible path. So it's the idea that you can, you can say, OK, every time something works, you reinforce that particular route, and you discard the ones that don't. So a Markov decision process is a, a mathematical way of representing that. And it consists of five different values. So you have a particular state. And that could be you know, where you are in a particular place. And then you have a set of actions, or you have an action which says, I could go forward, I could go backwards, I could go left, I could go right. Then you have a probability, probability that an action could lead to a new state. And this is where you can gradually change the values of those things. So you can say, OK, I'm in state A, and if I go forward, the probability is 50-50 you know, that I will end up in state B or state C. Then you get a reward for transitioning, because ultimately you've got some goal that you want this to, to be involved with. So you say, OK, there's a probability of moving from one state to the other, but what's the reward in terms of transitioning? You know, If I can move with a probability of 50-50 to state B or state C, which is the state I actually want to be in more? So if state C is a preferable one, that will have a, a bigger reward than the movement to state B. And then you've got a discount factor, which is where you include also a difference in terms of the importance between future rewards and 
present rewards. <laughs> this, is, this is one of those things I'm trying to explain to my son at the moment, because he's 11 years old. He doesn't get the idea of delayed gratification. You know, he wants everything right now, but he doesn't understand that maybe it's better if he waits a bit of time before he gets to something. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with there. Now, you can represent that as a, a graph where you've got the orange, uh, sorry, you've got the green blobs, which are a set of states, and then you've got the orange blobs, which are a set of actions, and then you've got the links between them, which are the probabilities of moving from a state through an action to another state, and then the little orange squiggly arrows are the results that you get at the end. So this is a way of representing a Markov decision process graphically, but you can do it mathematically in your computer program. One of the things that I saw when I was researching this project and thinking about what to do was a really interesting example of how you can use deep learning. And this was something which um, Google have uh, DeepMind. It was a company that was in the UK that Google acquired. And what DeepMind did was they, they said, OK, let's see how we can use a thing called a deep queue network. And a queue network is where you've got a quantity of a state action combination. What they did was they said, OK, let's take Atari video games. And Atari video games are nice because they are two-dimensional. Because they're quite old, the resolution is not as high, so we're not dealing with millions and millions of pixels. We're dealing with thousands and thousands of pixels. So the idea was to give this neural network video frames. So all it would get in terms of information was video frames. And it had to interpret from those video frames what was going on. And the idea was that um, with those video frames and a goal, which was to score the highest score for the game, and a few sort of basic ideas of how to control the game, so inputs to the game, it could then learn how to play these video games. And it did. So it actually learned how to play things like Breakout, which we've got there. And by trial and error, it found out that by moving the paddle across so that the ball intercepted with the paddle, it got a higher score. So that's what it started doing. It started making sure that the paddle would intercept the ball to reflect it back and then get a higher score. So it learned about how to do that. It wasn't programmed to do that in terms of like actual programming to say, OK, move the paddle to do it this way. It learned how to do it. And I thought that was a really interesting application. It showed what can be done with this kind of thing in that kind of context. Right. <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about the project that I worked on for this. So first of all, project hardware. So I like the Raspberry Pi. Who's got a Raspberry Pi? OK, good, excellent. Quite a lot of people have got Raspberry Pis. Raspberry Pi is fantastic. Um, they've been hugely successful, primarily because of the cost. When they first came out, it was a $25 computer. And in those days, that was, you know, that was really cheap. Great power, great connectivity. You could do lots of things with a Raspberry Pi. They've since come out with the Raspberry Pi Zero. The Raspberry Pi Zero is just like insane. It's a fully you know, configured computer. It has a 32-bit processor. It has half a gigabyte of memory. It's $5. You know, it's just unbelievable to think that you can have these things. Um, yeah, so the Raspberry Pi, I, I've been fortunate enough to go and meet the Raspberry Pi people a couple of times and have some discussions with them around Java. So they, they started run, you know, started producing these things, did 10,000 boards. They got over 100,000 orders for the Raspberry Pi on the first day that they released it. And they've sold over 10 million boards. Um, and that was up until September of last year. So th there's well over 10 million boards being sold. There are variations on the Raspberry Pi. I'm sure you know about these. So the, the old one was the Model A. That had a, a slightly slower processor, single core, less memory. Model B, which is the one that they still have at the moment, started off with a single core processor, but now has a quad core processor. $25, you get a quad core processor, and you get a gigabyte of main memory. You can also clock it at 1.2 gigahertz. So, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a small processor at all. It's not a small computer. And then, as I said, there's the Pi Zero, which still clocks at 1 gigahertz only has a single core and only has half a megabyte of memory. But it does have 
um, a micro USB, does have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth if you get the, the 0W version. What I thought was, OK, let's take some of these Raspberry Pis and map my Raspberry Pis to the neocortex. Neocortex has a number of layers. Why don't we create a number of layers as Raspberry Pis? Each Raspberry Pi would indicate a layer of the neural network, a layer of our neocortex. And then we'd connect them all together using network, because that was easy. And we'd connect those to a laptop, so the laptop could actually control the, uh, whatever we were going to do with it, so that it could send messages to the neocortex, the neocortex would process them, and then send back the results. So this was the sort of basic idea that I came up with. Now, I, I built my Raspberry Pi cluster. And this is my Mark I version. So I used the older um, Raspberry Pi Bs that I had some hanging around. So I kind of bolted them all together, got a power supply that had lots of USB outputs, and connected them all with, um, there's a, actually a switch at the back there. I also put on the top, there's a little um, SSD drive that I, I found a, a hat for. And I, so I put that on there because I thought I'd want extra space for storage. That worked OK, but and then I came up with a slightly better idea, which was my Mark II version. And that's what I've got on the, the desk here. So this is a little bit smaller, a little bit more portable. And so it uses one Raspberry Pi B at the bottom, and then I've got four Raspberry Pi w, uh, zeros on the top. And they fit into this um, extra board, which allows you to, to create a cluster from them. Um, I've also, the, the white box underneath is actually a hard disk drive that, uh, again, I had originally because I thought it needed more storage. But it turns out, for what I've been doing, you can use the SD card, and that's actually quite, uh, quite accommodating in terms of the space that it has. As I said, there's a, this little board there, which is called a, a cluster hat. And the cluster hat uses the USB port on the Pi Zeros to provide the network connectivity. So you actually network not through um, a traditional Ethernet kind of connection. You use the USB to do that. All seems to work very nicely. So you've got different ports there. You plug them in. And then there's also control lines that you've got through the GPIO so that you can turn them on, you can turn them off. Um, you've got different LEDs that you can turn on and off and so on, things like that. But it allows you to create a very simple cluster where you've just got a, a set of IP addresses, and then you can connect you know, the different applications that you want on there. Let's talk a little bit about Java, since it is a Java conference. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about Java. Java for embedded applications. Right. Why should we use Java in embedded applications? Um, well, the answer is write once, run anywhere. You can develop your code on the laptop very easily, and then you can move it directly to the Raspberry Pi embedded device without having to recompile it. There's no tool chain. There's no cross-compilation, none of that. It's just very simple. Write the code, compile it, move it. Great. The other thing is it's got a, a very wide range of libraries. And we'll talk more about this in a moment. But um, if you want to develop these kind of things, it's always handy if you can build on the work of other people. You may have ideas of how to do things, but it's great if you've got libraries to make life simpler for you. Especially for the Raspberry Pi, interfacing is actually very simple. There's lots of GPIO lines. There's I squared C, SPI. Now, I haven't used those in the, this project yet, although I've got some ideas for that. But having libraries that enable you to do that in a simple way also makes life very easy when it comes to, to programming. From a, uh, a machine learning and a, a um, sort of neural network sort of concept, Concurrency is something that you need, because you, what you want to have is lots of nodes in your neural network and run them as separate threads. So having concurrency built into the language also makes it very, very good for what we're trying to do here. And even if you want to interact with native libraries, um, if you want to do some of the computer vision things, then interacting with native code through JNI is something that could be useful as well. My marketing slide is around Azul because we have this thing called Zulu. Zulu is our build of the OpenJDK. In addition to making freely available versions for the standard Windows, Mac, and Linux, we also have free versions that are available for the Raspberry Pi and ARM. So you can get 
an OpenJDK build for ARM from us and put it on the Raspberry Pi. Passes all the TCK tests. Um, we've also ported it to some other things, so we do a PowerPC version as well. We support ARMv6, ARMv7, even ARMv8. And um, in fact, the 64-bit version is now released. So we, we have a 64-bit ARM version. Drop-in replacement for other JVMs, so you don't have to change anything to use Zulu, and no licensing restrictions in terms of field of use. Right, so we talked about the basics of machine learning, we talked about the hardware, we talked about why you would use Java on the devices. Talk a little bit about machine learning in Java. So there is this great library that I've been using, and the library is called Deep Learning 4J. This is the idea of having a Java library that provides you with a tool set for developing machine learning and deep learning and reinforcement learning applications. Really at the heart of this is a thing called ND4J. ND4J is n-dimensional arrays for Java. What you find when you start doing machine learning applications is a lot of what you're dealing with is arrays of information. You've got vectors, and then you've got arrays, and you need to do array manipulation and name, array multiplication. Because all of the, the information you've got coming in, remember, is n dimensions. So that's the elements you have in your array, and then you have to multiply those. So a lot of it is doing mathematics for that. So ND4J is a, a very powerful set of tools for that. There's also a thing called DataVec. DataVec is a set of library classes which allow you to transform the data into these feature vectors. So the vectors that you need, you can transform, trans, transform the data that you have into that. And then you've got a thing called an arbiter, which is a set of classes that allow you to evaluate the machine learning models that you have. So this is the, the idea of um, having training sets, and then be able to evaluate that and see whether you need to use different data sets, different testing sets, and so on. And then hyperparameter optimization. Hyperparameters are the sort of the values that you want to use which are outside of the training set. They're the things which are the values that are created by the training data. There are a number of core classes which make up this library. Um, there's a neural net configuration. That has an optimization algorithm associated with it, so it makes it simple in terms of creating a neural network and then having the, the optimizations associated with it. You can create a multi-layer configuration, and you can have what's called back propagation. So this is where you can connect the nodes from different layers so they go backwards, and it, it allows you to say, OK, so we've got this information. We can then have a feedback loop which says, give this value back to the, the earlier layer so that it can use information based on what's, what's happened further down the line. And then there's a couple of things which are is, is TBPTT forward length and backward length. And I had to write this down because I can never remember what it is, but it's truncated back propagation through time. Again, it's, it's just a way of being able to tune the neural network to do that. And then there's the, the sort of essential idea of a layer. So you can have output layers, dense layers, inputs and outputs. So it's, it's all about creating a neural network. The thing that I was looking more at using was a sort of another part of this library, which is the reinforcement learning for Java. So what this allows you to do is, is to approach inputs, which can be of two different sizes. So there's the idea of a low dimensional state. Low dimensional state is where you've got only a small number of values, and it could be where, you know, if, if you're playing a game, you've got a position, you've got what's in front of you, what's to the side of you, what's behind you. So that's like five values, say. So that's low dimensional state. But then you've also got a high dimensional state. So if you're processing video images, high dimensional state is not because the video only has two dimensions, but it has lots and lots of pixels. So the, the number of uh, dimensions that you have in terms of the data that you're inputting is very high. So Reinforcement learning for Java deals with both of those situations. Has a number of classes in it. Um, it has one around the Markov decision process, so that maps to what we talked about earlier. Also has one for the deep Q network, which is the idea, or the same idea that was used for learning to play the Atari video games. And then there's uh, an abstract class around the policy. 
The policy is what it uses to choose what to do next. Because remember, in the Markov decision process, it's the idea if you're in a particular state, you've got probabilities associated with certain actions, so what do you do? Do you go left or do you go right? And then there's different policies that you can have associated with that. I won't go through the details of that. There's, there's different things there. There's an AC act critic poli policy, a Boltzmann Q probability distribution, because Boltzmann was a physicist who did some work with um, probability. There's the deep Q N policy and the epsilon greedy partial, partially random policy. Right, but you can read up on that if you want more detail. Right, let's get into Minecraft. Okay, Minecraft and Project Malmo. Who's played Minecraft? Right, yes, good. So Minecraft, immensely popular construction game. My son, who is 11, he loves it. He plays Minecraft all the time, plays Minecraft with his friends, spends ages. If anything, he spends more time watching other people playing Minecraft on YouTube, which I can't quite get my head around yet. It's one of these weird things that the kids today love to watch other people playing video games, but uh, there you go. So, Minecraft, um, the first version of Minecraft was written in Java. So this is really cool because 121 million copies sold worldwide, probably the most successful Java desktop application in time, probably the most one, successful one ever. Um, Mojang, who were the company who created Minecraft, uh, the lead programmer called Notch, they were acquired by Microsoft in 2014. Now, if you haven't played Minecraft, this is the kind of thing that you see. So it's a very um, boxy, graphical environment. It's not high resolution. It's not the idea that you've got these fantastic graphics where you can see you know, hair waving and, and sea spray and things like that. No, it's all about 8 by 8 by 8 cubes and being able to like, throw them around and, and smash them up and put new ones in and, and all sorts of things like that. Related to that was a thing called Project Malmo. So Project Malmo I came across because Microsoft Labs had developed this. And what they said is, oh, Minecraft could be a really interesting platform for developing artificial intelligence machine learning applications. Because it's not terribly high resolution in terms of the, the, the graphic side of things, it's kind of like the Atari thing, where you've got sort of a smallish set of data. I mean, it's, it's certainly more than the Atari side of things, but it's not fantastically high resolution. So you can use the data from Minecraft and potentially not need quite so much processing power to interpret what's actually going on. So the idea in terms of Malmo is that you get a mod for Minecraft. You install the mod, and that allows you to have your machine learning agent, if you like, controlling the game. So it doesn't have to sort of simulate things like keystrokes and, and things like that. It actually has an interface into the mod which allows you to send commands and say, I want to do this or I want to do that. And it also allows you to get information from the game. So again, you don't have to do screen scraping to get the video frames. You can get them directly from the Malmo mod or you can get the low dimensional state in terms of I'm standing here, I'm at position X, Y, Z, I can see this in front of me, these type of blocks, and so on. So all of that becomes very simple from the Java perspective. Looking at a few lines of code, um, what you do is you basically set up an agent host, which is what you're going to use to connect to the Minecraft game. And then you create a client pool, which is the, the actual connection. And the nice thing is you can do that through an IP address, so you don't have to run it on the same machine that you're running your, your Minecraft game on. You can connect remotely to the Minecraft machine. You then have a thing called a mission specification. The mission specification determines what you're actually trying to do. So you can say, OK, I want to run the game for a certain amount of time. I want to have the video resolution set at this particular size, because this is how I'm processing the data and so on, things like that. Um, then you can get a mission record as well. So you can record all the information about what's going on. And as you play your game for 10 or 20 seconds, all of the details about what happened during that game can be recorded. And that way you can, you can use that to look at how your machine learning algorithm dealt with the information in the game as it got played forward. So you can do things like you can record video of the game as it's being played. You can record all the rewards you got 
as the game went on. You can get the observations, all sorts of things like that. And then what you do is you basically start the mission. So you say, OK, I want to play the game, start the game playing, get the information from that, and then have the game run. In terms of the interaction, um, like I say, mission spec is the, the thing that you, uh, you use to interact with the game. The, you can do things like setting the mode to creative rather than survival. You can also do start at, end at, which is like positions where you want to be. And you can, you can populate the world in a way to set it up um, so that it has certain things when the game begins. So you can put blocks in different places uh, and do things like that. Agent host is where you start the mission. You can look at the, the world state, and you can also send commands. So you can say move, um, you know, drop, pick up, things like that. Putting it all together. OK, so I, I had my hardware. I got the idea of reinforcement learning for Java, um, all those kind of things. How did I put it together? So the, the sort of overall architecture was Raspberry Pi 3 acting as the main controller. That had the Malmo library in it so that it could talk to the, the laptop. The laptop was running Minecraft. And then I had my four Raspberry Pi zeros acting as, the, as four layers. Obviously, it should have been six, but the, the cluster didn't work that way. So I had four layers in my neural network so that I could say, OK, I've got an input layer. So I sent the, the state of the Minecraft world from my controller to the input layer. The input layer would then do some processing on that, pass it to a filter layer. That would then pass the results onto another filter layer, pass that onto an output layer, do something to determine what to do, and then send that back to the controller. So ultimately, what you got is, well, here's the idea. It's not quite finished yet. Um, the idea is that you can either pass the, the world state or video frames into the input, and out the bottom, you get commands saying, move here, do this, do that. Now, in terms of my demo scenario, what I started off with was thinking, OK, so what do I want to do in Minecraft? I thought, hmm, let's have my agent build a house. Great, that's a, you know, that's a, a fine task to, to have to do. Turns out that's really hard. Trying to get a machine to learn how to build a house by trial and error very, very complicated. So I pretty quickly abandoned that idea. So I thought, let's simplify this. OK, demo revision one, let's have it build a wall. Mm. Yeah, no, it turns out that's simpler, but still very complicated. Trying to get you know, trial and error to build a wall, still too complicated. So I came up with demo revision two, which is what I'm kind of currently working on at the moment, which is just to stay alive. So you put the number of blocks out in front of the, in, in the world, and you want the agent to learn which blocks are dangerous and which blocks are not dangerous. So it, it's, it's a much simpler task, and it's a much better way to start in terms of machine learning. So in terms of like, the application to uh, machine learning to Minecraft, as I said, the, the, the whole idea of deep learning for J and RL for J is using vectors. So what I had to do was figure out how to populate those vectors with information from Minecraft. And as I said, there is this idea of world state, which says, I'm standing in this position. These blocks are available in front of me, so you, you know certain information about what's going on. But it's, it's quite a simple set of data. The idea of the long-term goal is to be able to use video frames from the game and then have the game actually interpret those and figure out what's going on. But I haven't got to that point yet. Um, Again, in terms of trial and error, you start with random moves. So you, you, you start with random moves, see what happens, which ones work better, and then you use that as your trial and error to start learning. And then you move away from using random moves to using moves which you've got based on the information that you've learned. You use reinforcement to do that. So before I show you the demo, um, conclusions and future directions. So, you can use embedded hardware for AI, machine learning, deep learning. Um, it's, you know, I mean, clearly, if you were trying to represent a real brain, you would need more processing power. But I've not found any problems with what I've done so far. The, the Raspberry Pis, you know, they, they've got enough processing power that you can set up a, you know, a neural network with a few nodes, and you can, you can start doing some processing and get some kind of stuff going. So you don't really need, like, massively um, Massive processing power on that. Java is an ideal language for this. Um, you know, it's easy to learn. 
simple threading model, many, many useful libraries. So I've, I've found it very easy to get into this using Java. Microsoft, definitely a fun tool for developing machine learning algorithms. A couple of things I've got in terms of future directions, um, certainly working on more machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning around Minecraft, trying to make my player better, uh, give it some more interesting tasks. I'm also interested in exploring the idea of using um, GPUs rather than CPUs, because a lot of the, the processing tends to be very simple, so you don't need a, a big, like, complicated processor to do that. You can use a GPU. And I've actually got, um, there's an NVIDIA sort of development board that you can get, which has lots of these GPUs available, and you can um, write what's called JCUDA code. So that's one of the things I want to do. And then there's also the idea of using some machine vision, using OpenCV as a way of um, interpreting the video frames. Places you can go for more information if you're interested. Um, I, will, I think I've already put these slides on SlideShare, but I will put them, uh, I'll put them up, I'll get on SlideShare. RaspberryPi.org, ClusterHat.com is where I got my thing from, um, Deep Learning for J, Minecraft.net, um, and then there's also the Project Malmo link there as well, Zulu.org for our version of Java. I will put the code up on GitHub. Um, I do keep promising this when I do this presentation. Uh, once I get a, a little bit of time to just do a little bit of polishing, just tidy it up a bit, I will put it up on GitHub, and I'll tweet out a link to that when it's ready. So let's see the demo. Now, I, I must admit, when I <laughs> had a bit of a shock this morning, because I set up the, I've, I've been working on the demo, and do you know how it is? I, I was working on the demo, and then a couple of days ago, I stopped because I had to do some preparation for, for this event today. And I came back to it this morning, and I thought, oh, I'll just check that my demo works. And I was like, uh, ooh, it crashes. Ooh. Ooh, what did I change? What, what, what? I had to try and figure out what I changed to, to make it stop working so I could unchange it and make it start working again. Fortunately, I think I have done that. So hopefully it's, it will still work. Right. So. so what I've got here is, as you can see, I've got Minecraft. And I've got um, software running on my laptop, which will then talk to the oh, no, no, it's not that, uh, which will then talk to my cluster. So we'll see whether that works. Okay, so what it does is it, it's now talking to the Minecraft game, and then what it's doing is it's actually so I've I've set it up so it has a, a number of um, fire I think they're uh, lava blocks yeah lava blocks and then it's 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 essentially going to navigate for thirty seconds and see whether it can get through the the game. Um, and the idea is that it's, it's using random moves, but with some, uh, with, with some of the machine learning. Depends on, yeah, so that's probably just going to keep going, because it seems to have gone in the opposite direction now from the, where I put the lava blocks. So it, it succeeded. Um, I'll, just, I'll just run that. <laughs> Let, let's see whether we can, we can find a bit, of more, bit more trial and error. So will it, will it find a lava block? So you can see that it, it will actually... Oh, yep, there we go. See, it died. <laughs> um, it, it's, 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 it's not that impressive a demo, I have to say, but it, it gives you an idea of what I've been trying to do, is to use the, um, the, the cluster to try and figure out from the results what it needs to do. So th this, there's still more work for me to do on this in terms of, of building it and, and getting it to record the information and stuff like that. But it, it gives you an idea of, of what I've been doing, which is to, to get it to move through the world, simple flat world with some lava blocks. And the idea is that when it bumps into a lava block, it should learn about the fact that the lava block is dangerous so it won't move into a lava block in future. So that, that's still uh, a work in progress, shall we say. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, guys.